Off top, Princeton researchers turned a live cat into a working telephone. Play the music. This is the Dominique Foxworth Show. All right, welcome to the Dominique Foxworth Show. That laughter you hear in the, here in the back is from uh, the great Foxworth Show Hall of Famer, Wozni Lambre. He is pretending like he's from New York, even though he's out in L.A. right now. He put on that New York hat to try to fool us. You are an L.A. man, Wozni. I, I reject the notion. Um, I, I do have a lot of love for my adopted home of Los Angeles. It's been close to seven years now since I've been here in um, on the West Coast and Drinking green juices <laughs> and, you know, putting on natural deodorants and uh. the things of that sort. But, no, I am I will be a New York MFR through and through <laughs> until the day that I'm gone. We're on ESPN2 now, so we got some new audience. So I guess we okay. should introduce them to my good friend, producer and co-host, the great Charlie Kravitz. And he is a Segway god. We'll mm-hmm. see if he can pull it off today. Got a big show. Got Obviously, you're going to talk Nuggets Wolves with Wozni. And then we're going to... Bring in Kevin Clark, talk about some more headlines. But you brought up that cat becoming a telephone because Anthony Edwards also transformed a cat into a winning basketball <laughs> player. And we need to start there because. <laughs> oh, God. The I didn't know how you were going to pull off that segue. But once I see it now, it was too obvious. It was so obvious. You got to be bad. kidding me. <laughs> no. Okay. Oh, my Lord. No, please, somebody get this man. <laughs> it's uh, unacceptable. Got to be kidding me. That one's unacceptable. All right. What do you want to talk about? Sean? Well, we got to talk about the evisceration from the Minnesota Timberwolves of the defending champion Denver Nuggets in game two. They're now up 2-0. They won two games at altitude in Denver, surprising a lot of people. What was your biggest takeaway from watching that game two performance? Uh, So, I mean, I hate to say this, but uh, that Charlie was right. was my biggest takeaway. (laughs) So last, uh, I guess Monday, we did a show, and Charlie was ready to bury, not bury, but he was like, I think the Wolves are going to, like, really handle this series. And I was like, I did all the <laughs> about champions in their, in their medal, and Jokic is so great, and they've been tested, and blah, 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 blah. And they got smacked, and they are not prepared. And we can blame the Jamal Murray injury, but also, don't throw sh- Like, I'm a former player union leader. I'm defending players. I don't call for nobody to be suspended. But Jamal Murray, how dare you throw some on the floor like that to me was what I was like oh this is over <laughs> he gave up first quarter of game two that was early yeah I mean look to watch the nuggets of the past two seasons before this series is to watch basically a metronome on offense like yeah. these guys routinely push out 120 plus offensive ratings no matter the opponent no matter the situation they are just machine like in churning out efficient offense right and then they run up against this buzzsaw and it just doesn't look like that like game one they struggled Mm -hmm. on offense um i think minnesota played you know slightly above their head on offense themselves but it was just a regular game the nuggets were way below their standards On offense, and I think it starts at the point of attack with Jamal Murray, where the guy in game one is shooting three of 19 or three of 18 or whatever it is. And he and in game two, it looked even worse. Like this guy's getting pull up jump shots blocked. Just straight up his jump shots are getting blocked. When do we ever when have we ever seen that happen to Jamal Murray? And I think the Nuggets, they they wanted to try to keep running their stuff. They wanted to try to keep getting system buckets, Mm -hmm. if you will. And the Timberwolves were just not having it. They were just shutting off their water at every turn. And I think they're at a point now, the Nuggets are, where they need their MVP to just go out and do that. Um, He just has to go out and beat people. It's not going to be about a system. He has to go out and try to score 50 against his matchup. Um, and, And I think that's the only thing that can save them at this point. I got a couple things. So the Murray thing, I think a lot of people are going to point to the injury, which I already brought up as part of the issue. Yeah, that's part of the issue. He's clearly hurt. Yeah, that's part of it. Yeah. But them boys playing defense, man. Yes. And I got to say yeah. that I appreciate how active and long, and we haven't even gotten to mm-hmm. the defense that they're playing against Jokic and the big guys. Like the perimeter guys are shockingly like suffocating on the defensive side of the ball. And I think that's something that – 
it's also tied into how we appreciate or we are acknowledging that even though the NBA won't acknowledge it, they changed the way that they call in these games. Mm -hmm. And Mm -hmm. the way that the Wolves are playing defense was something the first half of the season was not allowed. And the way that they played defense in this game is the way that they've been calling it the second half of the season and a lot in the playoffs. And it's to their big advantage. Like, they're a big, long, physical team. And I think they are – Jamal Murray or not, like Jamal Murray healthy or not, that's the thing that I, I'm concerned about that I'm guarding against is us saying that this is because Jamal Murray is hurt. Yeah. It, maybe it's ugly because he's hurt, but the Wolves just seem better. I might be prisoner a moment because this is my takeaway as well from game two was the Timberwolves defense. Like, I cannot remember since the – and I'm, I'm going to start this era of the NBA in 2015. Oh, hyperbole when, uh, alert. Get when, ready. I can, well, feel, no, I can no. feel them building up for some hyperbole. There have been it. a ton of great <laughs> NBA defensive teams. I'm not going to put them above and contextualize that the game was very different at different points. But since that Warriors team sort of emerged in the 2014-2015 season and won their first title, to me, with the way the game's being officiated now, I cannot remember a better defensive performance than what I saw in Game 2 by the Minnesota Timberwolves. The perimeter defense was – stifling. Jamal Murray didn't want to dribble the ball up past half court. They didn't have a secondary or tertiary ball handler that could take pressure off of Murray unless you're running the offense through Jokic handling the ball, which is not what they want to do. They want him as a, as like a top of the key passer and distributor and getting closer and closer to the basket. To me, this is a crazy comparison. We've heard so many Anthony Edwards, Jordan comparisons. The defense looked like a 90s Bulls type of defense team with, with mm. Pippen, Jordan, Harper just hounding people and like you're bringing in guys obviously you have McDaniels right. and you have Edwards bringing in Nikhil Alexander Walker it's just length and athleticism and stifling and they played so hard and then you got Towns thinking that Towns was going to be a physical presence like bullying people on offense and defense was stunning I get um caught up I, th- I think I get surprised not every off season or excuse me not in every postseason but there are certain postseasons where you don't know what the difference is going to be or the story of that postseason is going to be what's important what's the difference maker and oftentimes I fall back on like I'll go through all whatever analysis and thinking that I have but eventually I'm like who got the dude and I think that was partially how I came into this series and was like who got the dude? But it feels like this series and a lot of this playoffs, if you look at the teams that are having success, is a lot more about depth <laughs> than it is about a star. Does that make any sense to you, Wozni? Yeah, I think Denver's depth was always going to be an issue. I think everybody um, who was paying attention rightfully pointed to, you know, losing uh, Bruce Brown, uh, losing uh, Uncle Jeff Green. Those guys were key contributors to the bench units in the playoffs last year. And they were like, look, we're going to roll the dice on our young guys who are on rookie deals and, you know, count on our development, count on our collective talent to lift those guys up in, you know, their vulnerable times. But, yeah, you guys are right. The the secondary ball handling is tough. Reggie Jackson has tried his best. God bless him. And I think he's had spurts in the moment. But even he went off with an injury um, at the end of game two. And I just think they they just got this thing so well scouted. Like, one of the things that they've done – quite effectively was that they didn't want to let Jokic run fast breaks, right? Mm-hmm. Um, I, I, I don't know if these guys saw something in the film, if they got some at- internal numbers about, you know, Denver's offensive efficiency when Jokic grabs and goes, but they, they're they the first team I've ever seen be like, yo, as soon as Jokic grabs that rebound, we're getting the ball out of his hands mm-hmm. immediately. Most teams are just content because they see the big fat white guy mm-hmm. dri- dribbling the ball down court and it's fine they were the first team that i've ever seen in the history of this iteration of denver be like no we're stopping that and jamal murray the way that they're pressuring him literally out to freaking as soon as he inbounds the ball um and when Jokic comes up the screen the way that they're crowding this guy the way that they have the pocket pass that's that's one of his favorite trick plays is they come off the pick and roll as soon as he sees a little bit of of space for Jokic he tries to throw that pocket pass in between two defenders they're literally playing the play to not allow that pocket pass and he's not at the point where he feels confidence in hitting that floater game getting that you know putting up that that quick pull up to like the the Murray of of past you know 
was a little bit more confident hunting his shot for whatever reason. Yeah. These first two games, that hasn't been the, the mold that he's wanted to take. And, and Minnesota's like, yeah, you're playing into our hands because we're not going to let Jokic dictate terms to us. And, you know, you know, it's just been tough. We should celebrate Anthony Edwards in oh, all yeah. of the Warriors hey. and everything that they're doing. All the Wolves. I said the Warriors. Yeah. My bad. Well, they're playing like Brilliant the Warriors. Stuff, yeah. They actually aren't playing like the Warriors <laughs> at all. Like the ball doesn't move that much. That's a fair criticism of them too. That to the next round that we're gonna have to see is their offense is not. Uh, I don't know. It's not pretty. <laughs> it's it's True. working right now, but it's not pretty. But I guess you can win with defense. But the point I was gonna make was maybe because we think this series is over that we should spend a little bit more time on the Nuggets and on Jokic specifically. But you kind of sent us there off the top, Wozni, and saying like this is where he has a chance, and I don't want to be a Jokic hater. I don't consider myself a Jokic hater. But last week, or excuse me, last series, all the, like, Jokic greatest of all time things were happening, and I brought up, like, he don't have that resume. Like, I see what y'all see, too. Yes, he can play at that level. I agree. Mm -hmm. However, he don't have that resume to have him in these conversations. And now we're at a moment where he needs this, <laughs> kind of needs this to – continue to be in those conversations or to justify people putting them there in the first place. Am I overreacting? But that's how that's how I feel, especially since last year's run was not a challenging run. Like, I don't have a, a key thing to think about for Jokic. You think about all the other big men that we think of these greatest all times, they put up championships on top of championships on top of championships. And I know we can explain away why Jokic didn't get them. It's injuries, it's the bubble, it's all this other stuff. But Jokic, like... I know he don't care whether he's in these conversations or not, but anybody who's going to <laughs> honestly put him in these conversations. And the resume right now is a four-year playoff run, averaging above 30, 13 Nasty. rounds, eight assists, one championship, presumably three MVPs. And you're now assuming this is this is done. The Nuggets run is at, is at an end if they get swept out of the series. <laughs> do do I mean, does that sound wrong to you? That the I, Nuggets... I, I, it's it sounds a little bit wrong to me. Right. I think they're a little bit diminished version of themselves. Um, again, like I said, they did take a step back in overall talent this season. Um, and, you know, to your point, I think Jokic has to be heard from before the series right. is over, right? Mm -hmm. Like, he has to put his stamp on this thing in some way, shape, or form. Whether they go down, you know, in four or five games, whatever. That that You know, sometimes that's how the chips fall. Mm -hmm. But Jokic has to put his imprint on this thing because we've come to expect that kind of output from him even a, a Joel Embiid who so often comes up in these conversations you can say what you want about them ultimately losing to the Knicks in the first round he made his presence felt in that yeah. series um like it or not you know um but like the minutes that he was on that court again the Knicks are obviously not as talented a team as the Timberwolves but what I'm saying um right. still holds true Embiid made his impact on that series, even though they went down. You can't say Embiid was not a forceful, right. you know, positive um, force for for what uh, Philadelphia wanted to do. And I think um, Jokic has to take that approach. And honestly, I think one on one, I don't think he has a problem with Rudy or mm -hmm. Carl Towns. To be honest, um, these he, in the recent um, past, like he's kind of cooked those guys in his one on one matchups with them. I just think he has to take that mantle of like, yo, it's it's literally all or nothing it's all on me going forward one i think obviously Jokic deserves some heat if they get swept like this is this is the crown you wear when you're the best player in the world um and two this is something that your boss bill simmons brought up on his podcast i thought was an excellent point that this actually happens to great players more than we realize to pretty much everyone but bill russell they have a moment in the playoffs where they sort of get pantsed it happened to lebron mm -hmm. it happened to kobe um, it happened to, you know, countless guys, other, pretty much it happened to MJ, everyone except for Bill Russell, who was playing in a very different era. The thing that I think is, is more interesting is how the, the Nuggets as a, as a total unit haven't responded to adversity well at all. And that's the thing where if you want to take a look back at 2022, like maybe this team wasn't as tough and as like resilient as we thought, cause they played all of these, e these easy series personally. I don't love that because I think it does take a little bit of steam out of Ant. Like the whole one of the fun parts of this yeah. is that he's do is that Anthony Edwards is emerging as this guy 
and doing it to Jokic and doing it to Kevin Durant and doing it to these guys. So if we disregard their greatness, then it's it's also disregarding what Edwards is doing. Well, I mean, I think it's a fair conversation to have, and I yeah. try my best to position this as not a hater or disregarding. It's obviously more just my personal bias is pointing out that I was right a couple <laughs> weeks ago when I said slow it down. <laughs> However, Jack got twelve six times. <laughs> six times. Sorry, Shaq. However, I will say that we are assuming that it's over because yeah. we watch these two games. Yeah. Jokic's got a shot, man. Like, oh, this, yeah. And yeah. this is like one of those things where I will be a, a damn fool. No one thinks it's going to happen. But if Jokic just put up 50 for three in a row and just goes on the road, wins a couple there, and starts putting – like, that's – it's not outside the realm of possibility. He is that good a player, that impactful, and the Wolves are newer to this uh, environment. They haven't had – they haven't been pushed yet, so we could see, like, all the things that we question about teams uh, like this is they haven't been pushed because they haven't gone there, and they're young. I know they aren't, like, young, young, but they're young as far as, like, this type of pressure. Like, it, there's a chance. There's some hope out there. No one believes me. I mean, to me... Uh... <laughs> it's over. All right, yeah, you got to waste time. You got to sugarcoat it? No, 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 no. I don't, I don't want to say that. I just think, sure, uh... It's the it's the wolves. We've never seen them do it. I don't think we should just take it for granted that they're just going to start smoking these guys, you know, for, forever more here. I think that the Nuggets are going to uh, respond. I think they have it in them to play much better than they have. They might ultimately fall short, but in no way do I think that they're at the point now where they just can't win. Right? Right? Like they they just can't beat. The Minnesota Timberwolves, I, I think that's nuts. I, I think Minnesota, you know, God bless them. They are absolutely peaking at the perfect time. Um, I'm sure you guys have seen this stat. They are the number mm -hmm. one offense in the NBA playoffs. These guys finish either 13th or 15th, depending on what source you want to go to, in offensive rating this year. That is absolutely insane. Um, again, what they're doing on defense is what they did all year. Um, I know people made a bunch of jokes about Rudy not being there in game two and them still having a smother in defense. That's one game. I think Rudy has kind of proven that he's he's that guy. He's redeemed himself and his reputation in that way. Uh, but, yeah, man, I, I'm, I'm excited to see how the Nuggets respond because I do think – I actually do believe in that heart of a champion yeah. stuff, championship medal stuff that you, you know, briefly mentioned, Dominique. Mm -hmm. And I think that the Nuggets, you know, because they have some personal and professional pride, are going to show some of that. Was I do want to know what you think about the Wolves, which is, one, how, imp how important and impressive this Edwards breakout is. And two, if they keep rolling like this, do you view this Wolves team as a clear title favorite? Two things. Um, one, the Anthony Edwards thing is important because I remember a game against Boston very early on in this season that I, that I flagged for myself. Because after the game, my man John Krasinski at The Athletic, uh, the most tapped-in uh, Wolves rider that there is, he was asking Ant questions about the ending of the game. And there were like three or four possessions where him and Jaden McDaniels ended up on an island guarding Jason Tatum and Jalen Brown in isolation. And that's what Ant Edwards wanted to talk about. He wanted to say... We held up against these two superstars in isolation, in crunch time, and that's the type of team we are, basically. And I remember, like, cataloging that because oftentimes when young guys become the kind of people that can drop 30 a game, 25 mm -hmm. a game, they start being like, yo, look, I drop, I'm a guy that drops 30. The gritty grind work, that's for the others. Yeah. That's for the help. I'm a superstar. I'm a star. I don't participate in that type of grunt work. Anthony Edwards, after beating everybody's title favorite coming into the season, and they're showing, and he had a good game on offense too. Right. He wanted to highlight what him and Jaden McDaniels did in the pressure pack moments on defense. And I was like, wow, this is an amazing development. Fast forward to the end of game two, what is Ant Edwards doing? He's going out of his way to flag Jaden McDaniels again. He's like, yo, this guy probably had five points, five shots between the two games, does no complaining, and is indispensable to what we're doing on defense. And so this guy at this age to be taking that tact, 
about the approach and then understanding, having the emotional intelligence to be like, yo, it's not easy coming down court every, every, every possession, having no plays ran for you, not really always getting to participate in the fun stuff on offense and still working your butt off on defense and staying committed that way. And the guy with the spotlight on him wants to highlight that. I'm like, damn, this is special, man. This is special, special stuff. Yeah, I got chills while you were saying all that, in part because players like this don't come along often. So refreshing. And we we use the same words to describe him that we would use to describe other guys, and it becomes quite clear that we shouldn't have been using those words because we've devalued them to some point. And I think the juxtaposition between Anthony Edwards and Carl Anthony Towns is interesting because it's about authenticity. It's like Carl Anthony Towns was the guy who said all the things that he was supposed to say. He knew what the superstar playbook, the team leader playbook <laughs> said to do. And he did it. And he said it. But that <laughs> wasn't real. And Anthony Edwards, we see it and it's real. And there's something about all the things and the, the emotional intelligence and basketball maturity that he has is we know in part guys hit their prime 26, 27 years old. That's because they haven't left their physical prime yet, but they have reached their mental prime. And the mental prime, mm -hmm. part of that is understanding how important defense is, understanding how important all these ancillary things are that normally guys don't care about because they don't show up on a stat sheet, understanding how important the example you set and the things that you say because you're the leader and they carry more work, uh, understanding that you're essentially the quarterback and also kind kind of the coach and a little bit the GM and also like you can control the media narrative around it. It feels like either he understands how to do all of that or understands he needs to do all that or he just naturally like this is real. And I know that mm. everybody to some degree, athlete or not, all of us are like somewhat there's a percentage of our personality that is performance. It feels like sure. none of this is fake. And it, that's the part that like feels refreshing and exciting. It's super refreshing. I mean, it's also this is like a, a really gritty player in a league that had yeah. been one of the criticisms, but it felt like a finesse league in, in past years. And, you know, the personality helps, but it also is the fact that he's just so damn good. Right. Like, so yeah. like he's putting up. <laughs> all the performances that match the personality. And I think it's interesting. But I think those are connected. Sorry, yeah. Charlie, to yeah, cut totally. you off, Charlie, but I think that those are connected. I think that these moments, I think we talked about this last week and how when the tight moments show up, mm -hmm. Anthony Edwards seems excited about it. Definitely. Not not even ready for it, but like <laughs> happy almost. And it's uh, it's unusual. Sorry. No, I mean, it's it's really interesting because you said that, you know, he's doing this at 22, and I think that's one of the interesting parts about it. They lined up and built this roster with Ant before his, like, gigantic salary is going to kick yes. in and it's going to be a lot harder. And that's a credit to Tim Connolly, who made the all-in trade that got mocked for Rudy Gobert. That's him building this roster around Ant that really works and is so defensively dynamic. But the interesting part about this is we've talked about the Nuggets, and there was a point last year where we thought, this could be a three, five-year run. They stack a lot of championships. If the Nuggets lose this round and the Wolves become the title favorites, they'll be the sixth new champion in six years. Mm -hmm. And mm. that's an era of parity that we haven't seen in the NBA since before the 80s. And I wonder, are we seeing something that's going to be like the birth of something? Or are we in a different era where it's like the West is so strong that these teams are going to be fighting for the top every single year? I think this is what... Adam Silver ultimately wanted. Mm -hmm. um, this is what they've been dying for. This uh, this idea of like the NFL playoffs. You never know who's ultimately going to come out on top, right? Like this idea of the P word of parity. It's what they've wanted. It's why they've added the freaking draconian luxury tax rules and sec mm -hmm. second apron rules that they did so that teams, you know, the teams at the very top cannot just keep stacking and stacking upon their already elite talent. So this isn't by accident. This is actually by uh, design and it's what the league's been sort of angling this thing towards for a very long time now. So I'm not, you know, I'm not surprised by that outcome. And to get back to that second question that you did ask me, um, you know, shameless plug on my YouTube show In My Feelings. Check that out on the Ringer NBA's YouTube page every single Friday. Um, I mentioned that I thought this series was for the championship. 
I, I, I said that on Friday. I literally thought the winner of Nuggets and Wolves would ultimately go on to the NBA Finals and win it no matter who came out of the East. And I haven't been dissuaded from that thought. I mean, Boston, it's not their fault that they've played some poor competition, but they've dominated th- that competition. But I think in terms of strength of schedule and quality of win, you have to say the Minnesota Timberwolves have been the playoffs' best team. If this were college football or basketball and we had a media poll and a coach's poll, everybody would unanimously agree mm-hmm. that the Minnesota Timberwolves are at the top of that poll in, in terms of who's the best team in America and Canada, I guess. <laughs> um, I, 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 like, I, I think that's indisputable yeah. right now. I mean, it's hard to argue with, but, I mean, you got to show my thunder some respect. But uh, Your thunder. Sure. Yeah, I'm, I'm taking them, I'm taking them from, uh, from Charlie. Charlie loves the thunder, but I've decided they're mine because we got a turp on that team, no Vanderbilt players on that team so you can't have them that's how i'm just i'm I'm stuck with luke Cornette and the celtics (laughs) real (laughs) real obvious you're sticking me with the celtics (laughs) all right on that note we let my man wozny go appreciate you for joining us man um uh good luck to your knicks peace bros up next more headlines with kevin clark all right we're now joined by kevin clark a famed orlando magic fan football nerd and 80s movie villain. Welcome, buddy. I just want to say Uh-oh. that uh, b- we were offlining here about the mustache, and all of your mustache comparisons were in the last five years. You got to go further back, man. This is I'm trying to do like a vintage thing. Here. Oh, who? Do you, I mean, what do you want? Uh, like old westerns? Yeah. I don't know. I mean, you think I, you're Burt Reynolds? Yeah, that's I, yeah, I thinking, yeah. Smokey and the Bandit. I don't know. How about that? I, I, all your comps are Twitter people. Why do y'all? I mean, I feel like you got a bit of a never mind, a beautiful mustache. Welcome to the show, buddy. I love it. I'm <laughs> happy to have you. I don't want you in a bad mood before we do all these great uh, headlines, but um, yeah, Did great you, mustache. You look I'm like you could be the manager mood. of a Dutch soccer team. <laughs> is that that's a compliment? It is, I would of love course. that. They're all compliments. How are you feeling about the magic? How are you feeling about Paolo Vancaro? I'll, I'll make it quick. They need a shooter. They may mm. need two shooters. Should we talk about some real basketball teams? Sure. We're coming off of a drubbing last night where the Thunder mm. just had waves and waves of talent. Yeah. And the Mavericks looked, Luka looked injured. They looked like a two-man show. They looked under completely undermanned. And I'm just going to low-hanging fruit ask the question. After one game, does it feel like the Thunder are just better than the Mavericks? Yes. Yes. Simply, simply put, yeah. I mean, especially you were with, right. You were right. That was low hanging. <laughs> yeah. Especially with the way that Luca looked. Like Luca looks out of it. Like yeah. Physically and emotionally, or I guess emotionally because of physically. So yeah, they don't particularly have a chance. It sucks too because God, Kyrie Irving is so fun to watch and so talented. Like through the course of that game, there are a number and incre- number of incredible dunks and highlights and blocks that were mind blowing. But I still walk away from almost every game with Kyrie in it, even if he's not even playing well. I walk away thinking, gosh, that man, just the the ball handling and the body control and the shooting ability is just a combination that is so, so fun to watch. I don't know where the Mavericks go from here. I think there's, there's a reckoning because there's a, a, a lot of torch passing. Is that is that a phrase I can use? Yeah, a lot of torch yeah, passing in, in lot both conferences. Mm-hmm. And I don't know who's on the outside looking in. Like when there's when, when the ground starts to, to shift beneath everybody's feet, like there are really good teams that get relegated to minor characters very, very, very quickly. I feel that way about the Nuggets right now where they're actually seeing a market correction in real time where they're just like, oh, this might this winning championship thing might not be for us anymore. Like we might be getting, we might be getting supplanted in real time and everybody can see it every single game we play. Um, so I just don't know. I like the thunder of the future, the, the Maverick, the, the Timberwolves are the future. Like we're starting to see um, that kind of, of generation move in before, before our eyes. And, and, and I think that the, the Mavericks, like, I don't think Jason Kidd's a very good coach. I thought their defense. Was, he wears glasses was, though. He wears glasses. Yeah, he got um, glasses on now, point. so he can look no, like a, a better coach. Point. No, that's a good point. I would, I, would, I, I withdraw my, my point. He wears glasses. You're, you're a big Dagnell guy. You, you think he's X and O in him up? 
I, <laughs> he's an awesome coach. <laughs> no, I mean, you, you look like a big deck now guy. I the wasn't only thing I know about him, the only thing I know about him is that LeBron and JJ Reddick had like a, a conversation where they were both like, he's, he's on his P's and Q's <laughs> and I don't know anything about NBA coaching. So yeah. I just go, I go based off of who still wears suits and then I just look at, <laughs> and then I just look at results. I and think I, I just the, look at wins and losses. This series is interesting for some of the things that you were saying, like the passing of the torch thing makes this series particularly interesting because I do see between both of these teams, like similar athletes mm-hmm. around stars, but the difference it feels like that. And this does speak to coaching. Dagnow has faith in the athletes mm-hmm. around these stars to handle the ball and make decisions and shoot. It doesn't feel that way. So, like, you watch these great athletes on the Mavs get great blocks, great defense, catch alley-oops, but you don't watch them handle the ball and make decisions or shoot a shot that was not created for them by Kyrie or Luka. And in watching the Thunder, my my Thunder, play i'm a big thunder guy i've been high on the thunder huge all playoffs i told charlie coming in that uh this to the playoffs that keep an eye on the Mm. thunder i know they're one seed but nobody believes them they're young they're gonna be great that's good that was (laughs) a good tip thanks fox you got it but um (laughs) watching them like in the fourth quarter be comfortable with Jalen williams running uh, pick mm-hmm. and roll fourth quarter of a playoff game and like Wiggins making decisions and handling the ball. It's like no other teams seem that comfortable with these ancillary guys in these key positions. So we'll see what happens when they get in a tough series because they haven't been in one yet. But right now it's really um, impressive. May I ask a question? Uh, nah. This might seem hyperbole and then you're going to think about it and it's going to seem less like hyperbole. Okay. In basketball history, has there been a better rebuild, reload situation than what Sam Presti's doing right now? Like from where they were with, and I'm talking about they have, they're on yeah. very close to the mountaintop as far as Westbrook, Durant, Harden, they re- hit the reset button and they're this good this quickly. Like I don't, I, I, I'm trying to think in any sport of a team that was like, we're just going to tear this down to the studs and we're going to be a juggernaut very 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 quickly like i there it, it's, a, it's a mount rushmore i we we can skip the the shock and hyperbole i think you're right like I, it's hard to argue against that how good they are and how well positioned they are going forward which we always hear about their draft picks and it's probably an interesting way to go with this conversation is like what should they do with their draft picks i'm someone who's like hey the windows open ball all them draft picks up and throw them at a star and get and, and go to the next level, but I can see by the look on Charlie's face that he disagrees with me. No, I think th- I have a stat for you. I'm going to oh, stat you guys stat down. Oh, baby. Oh, baby. <laughs> the Thunder won 57 games with a 7.4, a plus 7.4 point differential. Damn. The 2012 Thunder, the KD, Russ, um, Harden Thunder, 6.1 point differential. What they've done with SGA, Chet, mm-hmm. and Jalen Williams and these draft picks is unbelievable. And there's something that... We've talked a lot about it a little bit, which is Sam Presti in certain ways running this like a football team. Like they have just waves of players and waves of options and they have indispensable pieces and then dispensable pieces on the edges. And we're going to see the NBA move into this new era where it's harder and harder to retain your whole roster around stars. Right. And we thought for years Presti was going to just cash in these draft picks, get another all-star, build around that, have elite guys. They're so good at drafting and developing, and they they hired Chip England from the Spurs, who fixed Kawhi's jump shot, who's really helped this team. They shot 16 for 34 from three in game one. That's obviously not sustainable. Oh, no, that's all Chip. That's Chip, big Chip. If they're going to continue to draft the Case and Wallaces and the Jalen Williamses and the Jalen Williamses and guys outside of the top five that are excellent, and they have all of these draft picks, you can keep Chet, you can keep Jalen Williams, you can keep SGA, and keep rolling in guys on rookie contracts that can be excellent players by the time you yeah. have to pay them. The interesting thing about this question, about this team, is they have shown the ability to continuously draft well while no one yeah. else shows that ability consistently, which even prior to Chip in England would suggest to me that it's not that they're drafting well objectively as much as they're drafting well for their team and they are good at developing players because I think that this is again and this is part of the reason why we had you on here is because you're a football guy like me and I think mm-hmm. basketball guys don't see it this way traditionally they see like all right a guy is drafted either he turns into something or he doesn't and it's a complete referendum on them 
Whereas yep. us in football, we appreciate that the culture matters, the system matters, because football is a lot more complex. All these things matter mm -hmm. to the development of a super talented player. And I think that the fact that they've done this over and over and over again suggests to me that it's not about picking the best players, but it's picking players for them and developing them in the system. Like they have a clear theory and understanding for what they want to do and they stick to it and it works. And the last thing I know I'm rambling. The last thing I'll put out no. there is I know we all think of Oklahoma city as a major disadvantage as far as recruiting free agents. But I think that oftentimes with restrict or any sort of constraint, is it like it opens up a different way of thinking? So they mm -hmm. go into a world where they're like, you know what? Yeah. We, we have max salaries, so we can't even overpay to get a star. We are never going to get anyone to come to Oklahoma City. Let's figure out a different way to do it. And the result of that is they've come up with a better way. And like you see that in a bunch of different industries throughout history is that the constraints are what leads to the best innovations. I was going to say, I'd be interested to see the data because in, in football, the data is that there are no super drafters. Like there's right. not, if you look at the player value, it just doesn't exist. Ozzie Newsom's the best to ever do it, but even he had cold streaks. Um, the the Ted Thompson you. Packers, John Schneider. John Schneider. But I'm curious, Fox, like being on the inside, player development to me, especially in college with young players, is weight room. It's just code for weight room. And then there's the scheme stuff. Then there's in basketball. I'm sure that there's, uh, you know, don't take bad shots, teaching them efficiency, all that stuff. But I'm curious, Fox, having been on the inside, like, I know it's a massive question. It could mean anything to anybody, but like, what is player development to you? Like what, when you get into a football program and you can say, oh, this place is different because they teach you what? Like, what does that even mean? Yeah, I think it's about customization. Um, mm -hmm. And it's, so player development starts with the selection. You and this is a very famous like thing associated with Bill Belichick in football is like, I focus on what the players do well. Can do. Yeah. So yeah. you find the thing that they do well and it makes sure it's something that's important to the system that you're running. If it's not change your system. And then from that point on, I think it's about focusing on the areas that need improvement and the areas that can be improved. And it's mostly in these games. You didn't mention, I mean, I guess um, in an ancillary way, you kind of mentioned the mental part. That's the big mm -hmm. part. That's the big part is understanding what to look for. And while you're doing that, you don't want to lose the fundamentals. I know the best season I had in my probably football career was when I had Emmett Thomas as a dedicated Legend. cornerbacks Legend. coach. I never had at any other level in my life, high school, college, any other pro team, we had a DB coach. We never had a dedicated cornerback coach. And I would spend every day with him when I was at the Falcons going over basic technique. And, like, you think most coaches, like, they know how to play football. No, we don't. We forget. We get loose on the okay. technique. So I think all of that matters, and I think that's probably why where Chip England fits into this conversation and that he's a dedicated shooting coach. What's well, the most important thing? What is everybody looking for? Shooting. It's, it's interesting. It's also, like, yeah, it's organizational stability. Ah, oh, man. Because Presti's drafting guys who are long, who can handle, who can pass, and they're trying to get the shooting developed afterwards. And, like, They've taken a bunch of bites at the Apple. I mean, the SGA mm -hmm. trade is going to go down as one of the best trades in NBA history for someone who's a top two MVP candidate and is still emerging. And they got that for Paul George who's going to leave along with now they have 15 draft picks before 2030. Do you think SGA, this is, I guess this is a, a similar question online we were talking about. Do you think SGA would have been this version of himself if he stayed and, with the Clippers? Probably not. Yeah. Being like a third option, Kawhi's in and out of the lineup teams yeah, more it, on the fringes it, it depends it depends what kind of motivation he has like mm -hmm. it, like would he have fit with big egos as a role player biding his time developing like it just you talked about customization it's also customization for for you know my whole thing on quarterbacks is geography is destiny like mm -hmm. you, if you don't get to spread your wings do you ever spread, spread your wings and i think yes. that's that's the biggest thing is like if you're it's possible the sga would have said i have to be the best role player in the history of the clippers and 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 that's his destiny and he's making you know 25 million dollars for the rest of his career to be just an awesome third option it's possible talking about the thunder and talking about circumstance i feel like we have to at least mention james harden as like the yes. player who was on track to be a great six man and then 
went on to be like uh i know we can talk about his all his a system moves, but yeah it went on to become a system all in itself but anyway charlie i cut you off mid-question no i, I just want a lot for the espn2 audience i wanted to just put a put a button on this and be like this thing that's really fun and interesting about this the thunder along with the wolves have been the two healthiest teams all season both teams feel like they have infinite timelines where they can be good now they can be good in the future because of young stars but it's exciting because this team even though they've played lackluster opponents in the first two rounds because of injury, they could win the title this year. And you never know if they're going to get another shot to be this good. And it's, it's really interesting. All right, guys, final question. Have you seen this? Have you heard about this? Austin Rivers has sort of taken over the internet. Uh, His quote. I can't wait. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm going to let you do the quote. I'm going to let uh, Kevin respond to it. And then I'm going off because this pisses me off. Anyway, go ahead. I'm just, by the way, I'm impressed Charlie's in Jay Leno mode. Have you seen this? Have you seen this? Have you heard about this? What, what was that set up? <laughs> well, well have, you, have, have you heard this quote? Folks. This is, folks. <laughs> Austin Rivers, son of Glenn Doc Rivers, was on sure. Pat McAfee. Ever heard of him? Ever heard of him, Kevin? Yeah. Um, he said, I could take 30 players right now in the NBA and throw them in the NFL. You cannot take 30 NFL players and put them in the NBA. This made people big mad. It made J.J. Watt angry. He said, you don't have a job, Austin Rivers. Uh, our friend of the program, Chris Long, was really mad. Gojo was really mad. Yep. Pissed off a lot of NFL guys. Dominique Foxworth, NFL player. Your thoughts? Nope. Nope. It pissed off uh, Dan Orlowski also. Oh, no, yeah. I, I'm, yeah. I am enraged by this but i want to hear what kevin has to say because maybe he'll have some better reasoning than i do i think that i i, I am on everybody that you just mentioned side I, I do not think that that is that austin rivers is in any way correct i think that there are tea leave readings that would give them more confidence here's what i mean like if you guys did you guys see the video of micah parsons against a sumo wrestler last yep. week mm-hmm. did you guys see that the sumo wrestler handles him pretty well yep. and there were people who were saying just openly questioning, like, why, why, why isn't there, you know, more consideration to just having the biggest people possible? And the answer is you would get them moving left to right and it would be over. And Micah Parsons would, would murder that person. Um, I guess you could play him at guard, the sumo wrestler at guard and just kind of scheme around him or whatever, but like it wouldn't actually work. But there are, you know, once in a blue moon, a couple of moves that, that someone could put on user athleticism of their size that would help. But the physicality, the the difference in athleticism, the difference in in body mass and how it's constructed, like the toughness part of it, like I I I just don't think. I mean, we're getting into like there's always the thing about what whoa what if the best Americans played soccer? What if yeah. Allen Iverson played striker? Like I'm I promise s- you, it's a different skill set. I would it's offensive like to, to say that that's all enough. these guys. That's enough. That is quite enough. I would like. To- I was cooking. I, I was oh, cooking. But you was cooking the wrong meal because you're dead wrong i'm team austin rivers what the hell? i hate it i hate that i have to throw my brethren under the under the what is it, the train the bus or something whatever but this is this stinks of people who ain't never actually been around basketball players and i was like this at one point i okay. used to think like the best athletes right, joe in ingles. the world okay, joe, joe ingles t- is gonna turn into justin jefferson okay, okay yeah you can pick joe ingles if you want but Joe, the NBA is not made up of a bunch of Joe Ingles. The point is, it's going to be hard for either. But let's be honest about the level of athlete that's in football. There are, like, really great athletes. I think this is the analogy that I would make, especially with the moder- modernization of basketball in that you can't get away with being an enforcer or a rebounder or a defensive specialist. Everybody can handle the ball and shoot in a way that is rare. And they are also, like, 6'3 is short. <laughs> like, this is absurd. If you think that I could make a tackle tomorrow, give me any wing in the NFL, or excuse me, any wing in the NBA, bulk him up. You think that he can't kick slide? All the intricate, like, footwork that they do with the ball in their hand? I've played, and this might be coloring my perception. You remember Birdman, basketball player? Yeah. Yeah. Chris so, Anderson? Yeah. yeah. I played when he was in Denver, he was suspended for something, so he came to, like, our local 24-hour fitness He was suspended a lot, so yeah, this does yeah, not yeah, narrow yeah, it down. Yeah, it was suspended yeah. a lot. But anyway, the point is, he played with us. Uh-huh. He showed up, and we had a bunch of football players, really great athletes, awesome high school basketball players. He was the best shooter and ball handler on the floor, and the Nuggets wouldn't even let him shoot. He was just out there. And I, I think this is the best way I can explain it is – there are a select number of skill positions in football where mm-hmm. you are required to have 
a level of artistry that is rare. But football is made up of a lot of blue collar employees that are just explosive athletes. There's a, a, a lot of essential workers that aren't surgeons in the NFL. <laughs> the NBA, they are all f- freaking surgeons. It is, I, I, I used to think this. I used to think that football players are the best athletes. And if you think about just in sheer numbers, how many people in the world grow up playing football? American men. How many people in the world grow up playing basketball? A lot more. How many people get to the NBA? A much smaller number than the numbers that get to the NFL. It's just like by numbers. And what would you rather do? All of us football players found out that we were the third best basketball player in our high school, but the best football player. So we gave up basketball. We would have stuck with it and been Michael Jordan if we could have. And I'm just being honest with all of us. You know what? Name anybody in football that you think could play in the NBA. Miles Garrett. You better get ready to get your – I hope your visa and your passport is up to date. You can play basketball in China somewhere. Like, it's it's ridiculous, the level of athlete. And he only 6'5". No one's arguing. Your counterfactual is that you once lost a pickup to Burman Anderson. Like, that, he's a professional basketball player. Like, of course he's going to – what I'm saying is you can't cross pollinate here. You can't so just you're saying say, we oh, can't that- have this conversation at all. No, I'm saying that the NBA guys can't play in the NFL and the NFL guys can't play in the NBA. See, that's where we disagree. You that's where we disagree. So, you don't that's think where Zion disagree. couldn't be Antonio I actually, Gates? Yeah. I don't think Zion could be Antonio Gates. Zion doesn't, would never play. He can't, he can't, he, he gets hurt just walking around the court. Now he's going to Injury sliders are off in this analogy. Either way, Zion could play in the NFL, but I, I guess maybe having been in the NFL, there are incredible athletes. But the difference is everybody in the NBA is an incredible athlete. Also, they're 6'5". And also, they have the hand-eye coordination. That all, and that's the, that's the point about surgeons versus construction workers that I was making before. It's like some guys in the NFL, like quarterbacks, have like unique level of hand-eye coordination and proprioception. Not everybody in the NFL does. Everybody in the NBA kind of does. And I hate to, be, I hate to admit it. I want to say that our guys are better. But they ain't. If I can drop a nugget. Um, nugget. So I talked to a couple people for a story a couple years ago when Jimmy Graham had, uh, had made the switch. So mm-hmm. Jimmy Graham obviously went from University of Miami basketball to one year at Miami football, was okay, and then becomes a huge star. I actually just saw Jimmy Graham on McAfee earlier today. He's an adventurer of some sort. Oh, now, yeah. So no, he he's does doing like, three um, things. Endurance challenges and stuff to raise yeah, money, right? Good for, yeah, good for, good for Big Jim. Jimmy Graham. But um, I was doing that, and I talked to Frank Hayes, this coach, and he said that it is a specific type of basketball player who can make the leap eventually with training. Remember, Jimmy Graham did play college one year of college football. So that's there's there's some training there. But it was from Miami, so it barely counted in that era. Um, but uh, he said quick feet, because yeah, I believe he was number one I got in the country. At, killer. I can't wait at, to get to at, it. At, 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 drawn, at drawn fouls. Uh, he, he, at, bl- at drawn charges, excuse me. Uh, number one in the country and then like top five in blocks. And so he can move vertically. He can move with his feet. He can shuffle it, all that stuff, right? And then as part of that, an old scout, Gil Brandt, told me that the Cowboys used to have a suite at the Final Four. This is in the 70s. They had a suite at the Final Four where they would literally – like host the you know if you've never been to the college yeah. uh final four it's it's kind of a booze fest for any yeah. coach who's not actively participating um it's a little bit like the combine in that regard so they just bring in like these guys from michigan state and be like hey you got any guys who are six eight might be good tackles yep. and that produced a couple of really really good players yeah. but they stopped doing it because eventually it was a diminishing returns yes you can get some but you don't have unlimited training camp spots you don't you have time to te- can tra- i take a quick time out can i take a quick time out yeah, yes 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 <sighs> I have a feeling how it's going to be a how, long time out. How, how many? No, quick time out. You just told okay. that story. That is evidence to my point. How many NBA teams went to uh, bowl games and hung around talking about, hey, got any guys that ain't going to make it to the NFL that we could slide over here to hoop with? None. Yeah, because there's 90 guys in training camp. Back then, it was like 150 guys. Back then, you just signed up for a sheet. My, it was like, it was point, like beer league my softball. Point, my point is that the NFL coaches recognize that the lower end of basketball talent could play in the NFL. No NBA coach ever looked at a football game and said, you know what? Some of them five nine dudes sure could work over here. Like it's just nonsense. Anyway, but it's my the quick time same. Is over. No, but it's the same. It's the same. Is that there's certain body types that work in both sports? Okay, and you need, that's the prerequisite. Right, let me, that's let me, why you be doing it. Are you done? So I can finally kill the argument. I hate that I'm on this side, but I I gotta be on the side of truth. Okay, 
all-time greatest athletes in the NFL, where would you rank Julius Peppers? Top 10, top 5, top 3? I, I mean, top 25, certainly. Okay. He was a mediocre college basketball player at UNC. But sit. I, sit. Sit. Ronald Curry was was a basketball player at UNC, mm-hmm. also and football mm-hmm. player. Man played in the NFL, couldn't play in the N- in the NBA. You got Charlie Ward. That's it. And you know what? To my other point, if any of us could have chosen basketball, we freaking would. Charlie Ward had a choice, and he was like, "You know what? I'm good." It's also all right. No, Charlie let, let me Ward, ask a little you racism at the time. Look, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Oh, Charlie, okay, Charlie Ward yeah, did yeah. have a little racism mixed in, which is let me also ask you why the NBA is better. Paolo Bancaro. Paolo Bancaro goes through with it. Okay. He's six Let's just say it. He should be Ogden. Yeah. Great. So he goes through it, plays quarterback. No, 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 no. no. <laughs> that's no. what he played. No, I'm, I understand that. But my point is that's the one position where I do think that, or that's one of the few positions where I do think that there's a level of skill that not everyone has. But honestly, the traits that NBA players have would, would probably be better in – those NBA traits would work to be a quarterback. But anyway, fine. Well, think- but, 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 but like a- Anthony Black, great example. So Anthony Black, Bruce Feldman wrote a piece last draft basically saying that if he wanted to be, a, if he wanted to be recruited as a college player, he would have been a total stud. But Anthony Black, Black went in the lottery. He would, like, he would not have been a top 20, top 30 pick in, in the NFL. I just don't, I just don't, I think it's completely different skill sets. I'm not good at any sport. No, so it's hard I think for me to... I think you're right. There are different skill sets, but I think that it's more likely to find it. Like if you think Paulo Bencaro probably has to work to keep weight off, he's six ten and he has the footwork of a defensive back. No one would get around him if he if we could just teach him how to kick slide. He'd be the best tackle in NFL history. Like offensive tackle, or he'd be an incredible pass rusher. Like that's a, the thing is. If you had, and I've like I played sports with other professional athletes, and then I'm like shocked because like, oh yeah, they make them like us, but just bigger. And that's the NBA guys are like us, but bigger. And maybe there's some toughness component. Okay, we can sort through. Maybe there are a couple basketball guys who can't take a hit. Sure, but there's a lot of them who are tough as and can take a hit. Can I tell one story really quick that I always thought was really funny, which is just that. Did you know that Tony Allen? was ineligible to play high school sports, so he was a dominant tight end under a fake name playing high school football. <laughs> what? Wow, I didn't know that. And on a happy that. note, by everyone agreeing that I'm right, I'm sorry, football guys, but you're all wrong. Mm. It's just the height. Like, yeah, so you're... NBA players can play the in the height. NFL, not vice versa. Yeah, the height alone. like we 6'5 is like average for them. 6'5 yeah. is huge for us. Anyway, all fun and games. Thank you. For joining us. Do I have to thank you and your mustache separately, or can I just get one blanket? Thank you. The mustache will get back to you. <laughs> All right. Appreciate it, Kevin Clark. Thanks. Till next time. Charlie Kravis, Bye, awesome guys. job. I appreciate you. As usual, you're the man. Shout out to Podville. I love you. And all our great producers, Megan, Serafina, Kevin, and Brian. Cortez is a coward. This is the Dominique Foxworth Show.